YouTube itself has 2 billion people on it on the platform every month, a billion people every day. You could super serve one of those segments and actually have a pretty phenomenal business. And we've seen it over the last like 24 months where ByteDance or TikTok is gone after even just like a, a use case of content under 60 seconds. And they've flourished and turned it into a multi-billion dollar kind of platform and opportunity. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the segment where we feature what we think are some of the best venture investors in the media industry globally. And I'm really excited to be chatting with Ben. Ben is the founder of Next Tent Ventures. Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Cal, for having me. Absolutely. Why we're having this conversation? We looked at well over 60 companies, or I'm sorry, 60, 60 investment firms globally that had a pretty heavy focus on the media industry. And one of them that stood out to us was Next Tent Ventures primarily because their investment thesis and focus on the creator economy. And also they have a pretty impressive portfolio as well. And your approach to the media industry as a whole and your specific investment thesis was quite unique as well as your background having worked with creators for quite a while and worked at YouTube for quite a while too. With that, Ben, I think maybe to start off, can you give us a brief overview of who is Next 10 Ventures? Sure. So the, the company has been operational for the last three years. I, I spun out, I, I left Google uh, three years ago, actually this month. And throughout my career, I always gravitated towards roles and opportunities in tech companies and in one media company, but spent the bulk of my career actually living and working in, in Asia Pacific in the region and into roles where I was you know, trying to help launch a new business unit or a new market, G generally bu building something from within the organization. And having done that over my career, I was starting to look at the, the growth of the YouTube ecosystem and opportunities that, that were falling outside of what the company is going to go off and pursue itself from either product engineering standpoint or from the business standpoint. And at first I was looking at like where to refer what I saw is like business opportunities to investors and people in my network. And actually I wasn't having pr pretty good luck at that. And so I was starting to see that from my vantage point inside the company, you know, I was pretty convinced that this was a large and, and fast growing kind of area. But at that time, YouTube was not yet public or Google wasn't public actually with the YouTube financials and the numbers. And so it was maybe harder for someone on the outside to grasp quite how large uh, YouTube alone was and, and how, how well it was actually growing. And so I felt instead of continuing to try to convince people on the outside and friends to, to take the bait and run with it and, and go pursue investments in this space that I might as well just go do it myself. So, yeah, so I, I, I left Google three years ago uh, to start Next10. It's operating as a venture group uh, that plays a role in you know, incubating some, some ventures, advising and also investing. Well, I wanted to, I think your firm is, probably one of the most unique that I've seen out of any company within the media realm, uh, primarily based on your investment thesis. You really focus in on basically creator tools, enterprise tools for creators, but then you have a little component of looking for new experience for consumers. And you, I think your portfolio does a really good job representing those two things. But I'm curious, on media, content, tools, they're so vast. How do you break this ecosystem down? What are you truly looking for? How do you identify what companies are really good fit? And I know you're more of an earlier stage investor, which is, I think, even more of a challenge in this space particularly. But what stands out to you? From the investing side, what I was thinking about was, again, looking at the, the YouTube kind of ecosystem and the, the first generation of the enterprise layer were multi-channel networks. And I think there's a time and place for YouTube was a little bit more reliant actually on third-party companies to manage and represent thousands or hundreds of thousands of creators and enable folks to monetize on the platform, do things like content rights management, ad monetization, and different things. And over time, I think as creators started to get larger and larger kind of on the platform, but some actually weren't looking to be represented or roll up under a large multi-channel network. They wanted to stay independent. And you know, then as the platform, and now if you start to have a lot of large independent creators, the thing is that the, the platform's not going to be able to provide all the services that some of these multi-channel networks in the past were offering. And I started seeing, this is before I left the company, was that there's you know, going to be a Gen 2 or Gen 3 of this enterprise layer. And some of this will be companies that are very focused in a particular area and providing kind of software tools, services to this larger growing class of medium size and large creators that can be generating tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue. So what I was thinking about at the, when I started Next 10 was how to actually identify some of these founders that were you know, pursuing this area and to, to come and support them. You know, in the early days, it was supporting companies like Stage 10, 
that provide a, a software and a tool set to people that live stream or SuperBAM that provides content rights management to a lot of large individual creators. So, so, so companies like this. I think the other piece that you touched on earlier, so let so th if that's the enterprise side, I think on the consumer, I think where that's kind of come from is er earlier in my career, I worked at eBay. And when I joined the company, it was leading the e-commerce kind of market. And it was across, you could buy or sell uh, a, a vast amount of, of products across many different categories. And then over time, you started to see some verticalization of that commerce and shopping experience. And companies really honing in on, on a particular category, which to eBay is just one of maybe thousands. And then some of those companies that are very focused in one particular area you could take Zappos or even like Flight Club, like two companies that focus on shoes or even like high-end sneakers, both billion dollar kind of businesses, which again, to eBay in those early days is just you know, the shoes category. One of thousands of different things that could be bought or sold on the on, on the platform. And I was seeing some parallel to, to YouTube and that it was offering video for nearly anyone at, at scale and across many different categories. And so I was thinking the same way that eBay over time, that was early days of e-commerce and brought a lot of people online to be comfortable buying and selling for the first time. YouTube's also forged ahead and around the world where 80% plus of its consumption occurs. It's actually the first time that people are experiencing watching video on their phone. But then again, if you want to start tailoring that user experience, you can get down into quite specific areas. And the YouTube itself has 2 billion people on it on the platform every month, a billion people every day. You could super serve one of those segments and actually have a pretty phenomenal business. And we've seen it over the last like 24 months where ByteDance or TikTok is gone after even just like a, a use case of content under 60 seconds. And they've flourished and turned it into a multi-billion dollar kind of platform and opportunity. So I think that that's what also I find pretty encouraging is how you can go after some of these segments and actually have rather large businesses with scale. And then the other thing, just in working and operating in the internet now for, for 20, 20 plus years, I've also just seen the cycles and some of this actually with user bases. And so you know, I have three kids, six, nine and 11 years old. And, and, and the things that I just see even within from my six-year-old to my 11-year-old, some change in, in, in how they gravitate towards certain kind of products and brands and experiences. And just I get playing that out for the next decade. Certain things that today are maybe somewhat mainstream, it's not a guarantee that they're going to have a lock on this next generation. So I think the people creating that also creates you know, good opportunity for, for constant kind of disruption. Really interesting. It makes sense. And I actually have two follow-up questions exactly kind of building off some of those points. The first one, it feels like there's this, it might go back exactly what you're talking about, which it feels especially for any category within media, regardless of the content format, there seems to be this challenge of finding the right balance between how creators produce and push content. And that's going to be directly or primarily on other social platforms or uh, social networks, or is it going to be driving users back to your own ecosystem, your own website, your own direct to consumer type of tool? And, Given your experience, especially working with the variety of creators and identifying these silos, is there a right balance between trying to be on social platforms and building out your own tool that goes direct to consumer and not relying on social platforms? Uh, generally, how do you think of this concept? It feels like a, a balance between discoverability and also ways to monetize. I, I would agree with how you just finished on that. So I think I, for some that use large open platforms like, like, like YouTube or, or Instagram or Twitch, you can use it for discovery, audience growth. But I think then if you're trying to migrate users and, and, and take the same kind of content you're making on YouTube and just migrate them over to a own and operate. And this has been attempted over the last five to 10 years and people are trying to build you know, companies around like mobile apps and it's take the same YouTube content that you were getting on YouTube, widely distributed for free. And now you get it on this new app. And in some cases you have to pay for it uh, or you have to go download the app. And, and on that, it, some, I know in one case, it was putting the onus on the creator that they had to be a little bit more mindful of that overall product and user experience, which you know, on a platform like YouTube, they don't need to think about the product and user experience. People in YouTube's product team go do that. So I think if it's the same kind of video asset, there's been some challenges, but I think where this has worked a little bit better is you use the video platform for reach and discovery. 
and where you're moving people is into a commerce experience. And so if you're developing you know, consumer products, license, you know, merchandise and that you can really, you, you can convert, you can commercialize and you can actually drive a lot of you know, f- fan engagement and actually loyalty. And again, it's around a, a differentiated set of product from what you're doing on the platform with video. Interesting. And building off even that point, it feels like media almost feels like it's a feature in some sense. And the business models, especially for creators and more on the social network side than any other content format, is monetizing not through the content itself and not trying to trap people in subscription. Maybe there's the Patreon route, but it really seems like the, uh, the focus is on upselling consumer products, merchandise, or even potentially services. Do you think that trend's going to continue or do you think there's going to be evolutions in business models for a lot of creators? I think they'll, they'll continue to be a, you know, a evolution in the business model, I think, but also on on merchandise and consumer products, it's not anything that, that's new. It's been occurring for decades. And before, if it was you know, developing kind of brand awareness and some consideration and loyalty or intent to purchase through film and television IP and products, but now you're doing that today through content that may originate on YouTube. And I've seen that a lot in the kids category. And so you know, it's gone from Saturday morning cartoons to cable network and Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon to then some of the streamers and Netflix, but YouTube with its wide reach and huge consumption actually with kids content, it's a great place actually to go off and build IP and, and build, build awareness. And for years, and I think there was, I think in some ways, a lack of understanding of actually how, how large and engaged that audience space was. And that there was a view I felt with some in the licensing and the merchandising in the industry that it wasn't able to go and convert. We've seen over the last you know, 12 to 24 months, a number of people actually convert really well from that platform and create brands that not even just e-commerce, but also at retail can generate in the nine figures of sales on, on an annual basis. And so to, to me, it, it's that's not, well, the, the new thing is the fact that you're proving out that you can actually go and build, you can develop IP, create that community, create that engagement, and you can actually drive very meaningful uh, transaction volume in a, on a fiscal uh, basis. But I think the connection between the video content assets and IP, merchandising and consumer products, like that, that's that been occurring for a very long time. I think there's in the gaming industry going on now for the last you know, decade to, to 20 years into the free-to-play games and converting or driving monetization through uh, virtual goods and microtransactions. In some ways, it, it grew a lot of familiarity to a whole user base that I'll spend money on cosmetic goods. And so I find then you move that over into the, the video space onto platforms like Twitch and YouTube. In some ways, you don't have to train a whole consumer base to accept actually spending real dollars on virtual goods. They've been doing that for over 10 years. So now it's like, okay, I'm going to gift you something through this live stream. And so the evolution was to go around a game environment into a video environment, but the notion of spending real dollars on virtual goods, that then just didn't start in the last couple of years. It's, I think there's some foundation that's already been in place for over a decade, but the acceptance of that. And then again, what I was kind of making it earlier, just, I see it in my own kids and how they're gravitating towards things and something that might've taken an earlier generation, some time to like process and accept, you get this like next generation and it's, they're already on to the acceptance and to, you can push the, push the boundaries, so to speak, in some areas that might've taken a little bit more time for, for it to mature. And which overall is encouraging that I have felt for a while and you know, maybe keep feeling it every single year. It's this notion of there's no better time than now to actually be a creator because the offering in front of you and actually how you can actually go and, and build out your audience base and, and drive real like engagement the size of that that potential audience is obviously far bigger than had you started on YouTube in 2005 or 2006. And then I think the acceptance of how you can actually commercialize that is a lot more there today. I think in the beginning of YouTube, there, there was no partner program and no monetization. And there's a lot of creators that I've you know spent time and, and worked with that started in that 2005, 2006 kind of era. And what I find with a lot of them is that they started with no notion of seeking fame and fortune because it, it just wasn't, it wasn't really registering that it was even possible. Because again, there wasn't little ad monetization on the platform yet. And the reach of YouTube in those early days is definitely not what it is, you know, now. And you get from this thing of, I'm not doing it for fame and fortune to, 
oh, YouTube's got a partner program. They're accepting me into it. They're going to go share their ad revenue with me. And it's, wow, actually the ad revenue is pretty significant. I can make more money doing this and had I finished college and had a job after college. This is what I was hearing from creators. And it was like, hey, mom, dad, I'm, I'm going to quit you know, school and I'm going to focus on this full time. And some of them are still doing it 10 years later and have been rather successful. So you have that kind of graduation and on the ad monetization front. Then there's this thing of, and that, that's all like automatic and through YouTube. Then you have this bit of having brands go and sponsor you. And that went through a phase as well. Early days, I remember people were trying to hide the fact that they were actually being sponsored because they thought like their audience base wouldn't really accept it. Like we're well past that. And then the next thing was like, I can't possibly ask them to go and buy something because now I'm trying to commercialize my audience. We're also well past that. So I think if you're coming into the space now, but you have this foundation bedrock of the ad monetization coming from the platform, you have a pretty vast sponsor market and, and endorsements to product placement and all of that. And then you also have a lot of you know, precedent now of how people have actually been able to not even just get paid by other to go promote their brand, but actually develop one yourself. And there's a lot of companies and you know, different tools and services that are enabling people on, on that way. So that, that's where I just feel if you're just getting into the space in 2021 uh, and you have a lot of energy and ambition, it's a great time. It definitely makes sense. And it seems like there's this explosion of ways in which creators can really connect with their ecosystem. We'll do one more question and then we'll close out. Is that all right with you? Sure. Uh, one of the things that was uh, kind of a, it seems like an emerging trend, especially across the content categories, ways in which platforms are building new interactive content or ways in which they can connect with users beyond just content itself. And I feel like your portfolio shows that you've made bets here before. You have the FC, FL, you have stage 10, I feel Koji, there's kudos. Do you believe that, especially for the short-term future, there's going to be a lot more interactive forms of content? And is that the future of media? I, I think, yes, so there, there will continue to be a lot more interactive forms. And I'd say the future of media in the sense that this is the, the dominant form. I don't know if I go that far, but will the ad adoption penetration of this be larger in two years, five years, 10 years from what it is now? I think ab absolutely yes. It's, some of that, again, is the, the blurring of gaming and the interactivity that you come to expect in, in gaming as, as a consumer, but then also just with, with general media and video, audio, and how, however you engage with, with media itself. You touched on fan control football. So their season just kicked off you know, a couple of weeks ago. And it's, it's American football you know, you know, in, in, indoor, but where the people actually watching live on Twitch are dictating the play calls. And so what you're seeing play out on the field is actually, it's crowdsourced. And you get this wisdom of the crowd model is actually quite fascinating. And yeah, it, it's not watching someone actually play a game. You are really impacting the game that's being, that's playing out right in front of you on your screen. So yeah, I think the ways that the interest or appreciation that I think that consumers have affords you as a game designer to play into that and you know, how you also create kind of media and content around that. The other side is also just the commercialization and how you can recognize reward, surprise and delight that that casual viewer to come into a kind of repeat a viewer into an engaged fan to a super fan. And just also understanding kind of the segments along the way and knowing that not everyone's willing to spend for the same. Some at that, that, that later spectrum are willing to spend quite a lot more. Again, seeing this in the gaming environment and that there is a, a group of people that will just consume and don't ever want to pay you a dime. Some that will actually be willing to pay and some will be willing to pay quite a lot. And I think with the, the digitization of media, I think it allows some companies to actually be very, to be aware and mindful and manage that, that consumer you know, base and the segmentation of those different cohorts that it would have been harder to do before through radio, through television, through movies distributed in, in theaters. So I think the possibilities there, there's quite a lot of possibilities. And I think that's what I find actually pretty encouraging and pretty exciting and how you're to what you'd be building today. Awesome. Ben, I, I really appreciate you taking the time maybe to close out. I, I'd really love to highlight some of the things that you offer and, and specifically are fun because it's a combination of you mentioned in the beginning, you do both incubation, you are venture investing, you offer a variety of advisory services, and you've been working with creators for, feels like over decades. So uh, maybe you want to touch on a little bit more about some of the uniqueness of, uh, of your funds. I, 
as you were just saying, it's, I'm focused on, on, on the creator economy. I have been working in this area for w- w- over a decade and working with the top creators actually around the world. So I, I've spent the majority of my, my career in the Asia Pacific region, and I was lucky to be working there and actually with a lot of top flight kind of tech companies. And I think each time it was Asia was always the fastest growing region within that, that whatever company I was working in at that time. And so I've you know come to appreciate how, how things are evolving in that region. And I was seeing well over a decade ago, certain things pop up there before they were coming to the U.S. And so though I'm, I am like born and bred American, I definitely have seen firsthand that not all great ideas originate here. There are great ideas that actually originate elsewhere. They're getting adopted elsewhere and they may come to the U.S. years later. So this is not the sole kind of pocket of innovation. I try to keep that in mind. And also as I work with founders and startups here in North America, and if you're connected in this greater economy, it is global. If you're connecting in with some of these platforms, the platforms are all global. And just as I've seen in my own career, they're growing the fastest outside the U.S. And so in some cases, like it or not, you hook into YouTube, you're going to be global. Uh, you'll have a user base or a customer base that will be outside of North America. And so I, I from a advisory standpoint or being hands-on and with some of the founders is working with them, thinking about you know, international growth strategies and working with a lot of folks at an earlier stage. So it's not something that that is that, that we're trying to, they're trying to figure out right now, but I'm trying to get them to plan ahead and having spent so much time overseas and being that guy before with Yahoo or eBay or Google, trying to actually build out some of their businesses you know, in, in these international markets. I'm now on the other end, trying to work with founders and, and, and stay ahead and, and st- stay competitive. Awesome. This is fantastic, Ben. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And again, why we had this conversation, we spent a lot of time looking at a lot of different investors active in the media industry and Next 10 Ventures. I think your investment approach, your thesis and your strategy is really impressive. And I think it's an emerging fund to watch for. And also, uh, especially seeing how the overall media industry is becoming, especially digital media, decentralized, catering more to creators, having a lot more power and ways in which content is created in almost every single medium. Seeing how that is your soul and core focus, and that's something that you've done for well over a decade, and seeing that evolution of the creator ecosystem is fantastic. Ben, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you, you inviting me to talk to you today.